Let's open up our Bibles here now this morning in um, the book of Revelation, book of Revelation and chapter number four as we continue um, in this. And, um, you know, as you're turning to Revelation and chapter number four, I got to say, you know, it's, um, it's really cool and neat just to, to know that we can be here together as, um, you know, just as a community of believers and truly come together and pray. You know, as David was praying, I was like, I was just being mindful of how God says that his house is a, it's a house of prayer where we meet with the Lord and commune with God. And, and that's really what it's all about. You guys believe that there's power in prayer? Come on, that's right, man. There's power in prayer, absolutely. So please continue to pray for the community and uh, our elected officials and uh, an opportunity, an opportunity for us to be used by the Lord and to share that the precious uh, message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. So, um, well, you know, I want to start like the guys. Have you ever, have you ever seen something like just been? It's just so. So amazing, and it's just, you get overwhelmed with uh, the beauty and the creation of God of, and the majesty of God of like one of his creations. You know, I, I, know, I, I like to go and um, see sunsets, and my wife and I, we talk about like, hey, let's go see the sunset tonight. And we're like, okay, we do, you know, let's go and do that. And then, you know, we get tired, and we're like, oh, the sunset's gonna, you know, it's gonna be like in two minutes. We're like, we missed it, <laughs> you know. But there are times we make it to go see, and, uh, see a sunset, and they're always beautiful. And if you're like, us, and, you know, you see a beautiful sunset there in Newport or Huntington Beach, wherever you're at, you're just like, you're there with the phone taking all kinds of pictures, right? And you're just like, man, how beautiful this sunset, or a, or a beautiful sunrise, you know, and you just see all those wonderful colors that the purple and the pink just coming off, you know, the horizon and the east and everything. It's just a beautiful thing, and I don't know about you, but I'm always reminded of the majesty of God when I see these things, you know, or the Grand Canyon, or, you know, there that, there, um, there in Yosemite Park, they got that granite rock right there, El Capitan, you know, it's just huge. People actually climb that thing too, you know, but it's just beautiful to, to gaze at, and you're just like, wow, Lord, you know, this is awesome, and, and just the, it really is kind of like a, the, I always think of the majesty of God when I see these things, right? Well, guys, what we're going to be looking at today is, is a little bit, some of the same thing here with John the Apostle as he adds to the moment that he has already had when he's seen the glory of Jesus. But in chapter number four, we're going to see, um, you know, how John is, is summoned up into heaven and he has this glimpse, a clear glimpse of the throne of God. The title of this morning's message is The Throne, the Worship, and the Purpose. The Throne, the Worship, and the Purpose. And so if you uh, remember when we were going through, um, when we started the book of Revelation in chapters, uh, really chapters number one and two, um, we, we remember that Jesus was there, like, you know, he was there in the midst, right? And he's, um, he's with the churches, he's amongst the lampstands and everything. And here in chapter number four begins the, the, the third section of the Bible. Now remember, when we were going through and started in the introduction of Revelation, I mentioned that there's three sections. And that first section was found in chapter number one where, um, where, where John sees, you know, he, he's writing down the things that he sees. And remember, if you want to go back, just look at your, your Bible in chapter number one and verse number 19 specifically. You can write this in your margin because verse number 19 is the outline of, of the entire book of Revelation because Jesus tells John that he wants him to write the things therefore that you have seen and we went through that remember John sees the glory of God he says write those things also um, that are and those things that are is chapters two and three so that's section number two and that's where Jesus is communicating to the churches and uh, he's telling the churches of areas of of, uh, of their lives you know and of that church congregation also that they need to change and fix and repent from, right? And then in chapter number four begins the third section, okay? Now, this section also in chapter number four um, of Revelation here, chapters four through 19, chapter number 19 is, uh, is going to be, we're going to look at the great tribulation, okay? So actually, guys, real quick, the third section can be broken up into three parts. So that first part, 
chapters 4 through 19, is the Great Tribulation. And chapter number 20 is the Millennial Reign. And chapter number 21 and 22 is the, the new heaven and the new earth where we all live happily ever after. And that's all good, right? Like every good story ends. Well, that's how it's broken up, okay? And so... Um, but real quick, guys, this chapter, chapter 4 to chapter number 19, again, it's going to focus on the Great Tribulation. Now, this Great Tribulation, also known as the, the 70th week of Daniel, you can read about that in chapter number 9 and verse number 27. And, and also, uh, just want to encourage you guys, as we had mentioned in the introduction, you know, several weeks back of this book, that um, the book of Revelation is, uh, there's a lot of pictures and, and you know, a, a, a lot of connection and parallels with Old Testament scriptures from, from, uh, from Exodus, uh, from Daniel to Ezekiel. As a matter of fact, we're going to see um, some imagery that, that Ezekiel also sees and, and communicates in his book as well. All right. So this is during the time of the Great Tribulation. All right. Now, this period of time, the Great Tribulation, many believe, including myself, is it'll take place after the rapture of the church, okay? And the rapture of the church, a, a good a proof text for that is in 2 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse number 17. You can write that down, okay? And so, um, again, many, many, uh, many scholars, and, and I'm not a scholar, but I, I also take this position of a pre-tribulation, and I believe that um, the tribulation will begin to happen after the rapture of the church, now, the vision that John gets of the throne here that we're going to be looking at, guys, um, is, now remember, well, let me just look at this. Look at verse number one with, with me real quick, okay? Here, verse number one, chapter four starts off and it says, after this, after this, I looked up, right? And then at the end of verse number one, as Jesus is speaking, he's, you know, he's summoning uh, John up, you know, to heaven. He says, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this, after this, okay? Metatauta is the Greek word. Um, but the thing is this, guys, is I want to also remind us here that what we're going to begin to get into is really the prophetical section of the, of the book of Revelation. Remember, the Revelation is a prophetical book. Okay, and so this is kind of a glimpse of what's going to take place after the, the church age, after the age of grace, okay, that dispensation of grace, you know, um, this, you know, this is what Jesus is talking about. And so this glimpse or this vision here that John now gets of the throne is like of, um, in my, like I was thinking of this is like, okay, Jesus is getting ready to execute judgment. So it's kind of like the control room, right? The room, uh, the control room of judgment, okay? Where execute, where, where the, where judgment is going to be executed and it hap, you know, and it's going to be that judgment is the great tribulation. Okay, and as we get into the next several chapters, we're going to see there's going to be seven seals of, and seven bowls of judgment that's going to be poured out into the world, and that is yet to take place, all right? And so this is the glimpse of what John is getting here. And so, uh, again, remember, this is a, a prophetical section here of, of the Bible. So I'm going to read um, the entire chapter here. There's 11 verses. So um, let's read this. Uh, follow along with me. I, again, I'm reading through the ESV translation. Chapter 4, verse 1, and it says this. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, notice he's speaking to him like a trumpet, said, come up here and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and uh, Carmelian and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne, notice around the throne, speaking of the throne, around the throne were 24 thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. 
And before, verse 6, and before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and, in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with, with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to stay. They never, they never get tired, never rest, and they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. That's an extremely emphatic statement right there in praise to God. Verse nine, and whenever the living creatures gave glory, give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives, be, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will, they existed and were created. Man, this is exciting. I don't know about some of you are like, oh, how exciting living creatures with eyes around their head. <laughs> you know, many of you probably just got this crazy looking visual about all these things. Well, we're gonna unwrap some of this and we'll do it the best that I can. And so here, first thing here, guys, I wanna point out is the throne. Again, remember the title of the message, the throne, the worship and the purpose, the throne. As I had already mentioned, Jesus was amongst the churches already, right, in the midst of the lampstands there. And now Jesus is in heaven, right? And Jesus there, he summons the apostle John, as, as John says there in verse number one, and the first voice referring back to chapter number one and verse number 10, when he heard the voice of Jesus for the first time, he said, that first voice, he summons me, speaking to me, and he says, it sounds like a trumpet the voice of God, and we see the words in red there, Jesus saying, hey, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this, right? And so here, many scholars uh, say that this calling of John, you know, up into heaven and the voice like a trumpet is that of the rapture. You see that connection right there. And the immediate focus for John when he's there in the throne, you know, he's there, you know, he responds to the being summoned by God. He's in the spirit. What is his immediate focus? His immediate focus is on the throne. It's right there on the throne. He's his focus, boom, right there on the throne. Now, when we were going through the book of Exodus a couple of years back, as we go through the Bible, we're going through the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter on Tuesday nights, we went through this and God had given instruction to Moses to build the tabernacle. And the instructions that God gave to Moses to build the tabernacle was to be a, 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 a direct picture of what the throne is like, right? The throne is like. And so if you want to go back and look at, uh, and, and look and read um, Exodus to kind of get some insight on that, I would encourage you to do so. But here, you know, this is the direct focus as he's seated, you know, as is to the throne. Now, what is a throne? You know, the throne. Now, here, a, a real a quick and very simple definition. A throne is a seat occupied by a sovereign. A seat occupied by a sovereign, right? And one who has, one who is sovereign is able to do whatever he wants, right? No ands, ifs, or buts about it. I'm a, he's a sovereign God. He can do it, right? And so that's where the attention of the apostle John is at right there, right? And so he, and we're told that he was in the spirit, it says. He was in the spirit and, uh, and he needed to be in the spirit for, her, for him to see the throne in this manner, right? And so being in the spirit, meaning God, the Holy Spirit, this is what this means, okay? Being in the spirit, he's a God, the Holy Spirit gave him the clear vision, gave him clear vision, clarity, and revealed things that John was, could, only, could not see on his own. Okay, these are things that he couldn't see in his own efforts. The spirit of God, you know, uh, revealed these things. And so that's why he says he, he was in the spirit when he sees these things, right? 
And so the description, look at the description as he says, I see in the throne. And I, this is the description of the person who he sees there on the throne. And it's right there. You can see that at the end of verse number two, with one seated on the throne and he who sat there had the appearance of, of a jasper and sardius. You know, notice he's not saying that he had this vision of, of a person, of a man. He didn't say, hey, I didn't see some guy with some, you know, nice looking flowing hair and man, just the most radical beard ever. And he doesn't say that. He says what he sees is these, these gems and these, this light, right? So guys, I think one thing to also remember, especially when we're going through um, Revelation, and you can also keep in mind when you go through Ezekiel and, and Daniel and, and other portions of the scripture, is that when, when heavenly things are often spoke about in the Bible, um, the writers and the people that ex had this experience are limited to human language, right? And there's just some things you just can't really truly uh, communicate or articulate because, well, there's no human words actually to say these things, you know, to talk about it. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians in chapter number 12, starting at verse number 2, you know, he, he says that he was caught up into the third heaven. And this is what he says, actually. He says um, that it's not lawful for a man to speak on. He says, I was caught up into the third heaven, right? There in the, the throne room of God, the presence of God. And, he, and Paul says, it's not lawful for a man to even communicate these things. I, in other words, he, there's no words. Like if he tries to explain it, he's not going to do justice, right? And so the apostle Paul kind of left it at that. But here we see with John as he sees this glimpse, right, of, of Jesus, of God there in the throne, you know, before the, the judgments are going to be poured out into this world. He says the one that he sees seated there, you know, with, had these gems, right? He sees gems and a rainbow. Now, these gems are the same gems. And again, if you go and if you remember back in Exodus in chapter number 28, starting at verse number 17, uh, there when the high priests were to, to serve and, and to minister in the Holy of Holies, they would have to have a breastplate. And on that breastplate would be 12 stones representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And the first and last stone that would be placed on that breastplate would be the stones of Jasper and Sardius. Okay, so here we see that these are the same colors and the colors really would be like a, 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 that of red and um, like a diamond type of a, of a color, all right? And so um, that's what's going on here. But it's not just those gems, right? The throne, it says there in, in, verse, there in verse number three that there was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. There was a rainbow there. Around the throne is a rainbow. Now remember, this is before the judgments of God is going to be poured out, right? And so this is the glimpse here that, that, um, that John is, is seeing. And so this is, again... The throne of execution, we can say, right? We're, we're, we're execution of judgment. I should, you know, um, I'm going to correct myself. Execution of judgment. And so God is going to judge the world. He is. You know, and the wonderful thing is, you know, sometimes we can think like, oh man, he's going to judge the world. That's a scary thing. Well, let me tell you something. If you have confessed your sin and you said, Jesus, forgive me of all of my sin, your sin has already been judged, you see, that's the whole, per that's the grace of God that the sin of the world has been placed upon the shoulders on the person of Jesus Christ. They're on the cross. And if we confess, if you confess your sin, the Bible is faithful when, when you know, God is faithful when he says that if we confess our sin, he is, he is faithful to forgive us and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Meaning the judgment of your sin has been already dealt with, Right? Yeah, so that's a wonderful thing. Yet there's this judgment that's going to take place during the time of the great tribulation, guys, is going to be a judgment really for those who have rejected God. Those who have, you know, just completely rejected and I, have, I want nothing to do with God. Well, this is what's going to be taking place. And so that judgment's going to be executed right there from the throne. The seven seals and the bowls of judgment. Again, we're going to be looking into that. But here on the throne, this is a wonderful thing is what we see is a rainbow. 
a rainbow. Now think of the rainbow. We remember when, when the flood happened and, and, and Noah and, and, you know, after the flood, there was a rainbow. And this bow, this rainbow that was in the sky was a promise was a promise that God here was not going to destroy the world in this fashion again, right? Yet his judgment is going to be poured out on this world. It's not going to be a pretty sight for those people who have completely rejected God. But yet we see the rainbow here on the throne, right? And so again, God here on the throne where he's going to execute sovereign judgment and the rainbow here showing that God in his grace... Again, God in his grace limits himself by his promise. God in his grace limits himself by his promise. He's a God of, you know, he's a God of his word, right? He keeps his word. Our God that we serve, he keeps his word. And so here we see that this is grace. He's limiting himself in that even, you know, that, that not the entire world is going to be completely destroyed, and we know that because, well, God is going to restore and, and replenish the earth with a new heaven and new earth. But there's we see, here's this first, you know, here in chapter number four in verses one through three, we see the throne, right? The throne. Now we're going to get to the worship in verses four through eight. And let's take a look at this. And we see here this, this, uh, this announcement that around the throne here were, were 20 Four thrones and seated on the thrones were 24 elders. Okay, and so these 24. Now, many believe that, that these are the redeemed of God for all time. These 24 elders, okay? Uh, the, the, the redeemed of God for all time. Now, remember there was 12 tribes of Israel and there's 12 apostles, both. And, and so the idea here is, is Jews and Gentiles, all part of God's redeemed. And so for you and I to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, what does it mean to be redeemed? My friends, what, being redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ means that we've been purchased back or purchased out of the marketplace of sin, right? And, and pulled out of that, redeemed out of darkness and now our feet set on solid ground. We've been redeemed when we confess the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is his grace. That is his mercy. That is his love extended to us as he, he wants to redeem us back so that we can have this, this relationship. And so these 24 elders here that are mentioned here, they, they are the, a picture of the redeemed of God for all time. And then in verse number five, we see, you know, it says here that there's, there's flash. Now, again, this is the description here that John is giving, you know, of the throne right before the judgment is going to be taking place. And he says that there on the throne is these flashes of lightning and, and rolls of thunder, you know, and, and here, the, and this is really the awesomeness, the awesomeness of God, the awesomeness of God. God is an, our God is an awesome God. Amen? Did that song just, you know, trigger in your mind? Our God is an awesome. Okay, I won't sing it. I'm sorry. But he is an awesome God, right? Again, back in Exodus over in chapter number 19, when the children of Israel had just been, you know, they, they went through the Red Sea and they're, they're journeying and they get to, the, to Mount Sinai there and, and they're at the base of the, the, the mountain and, and God has called Moses up, you know, to come and to meet with him, to, 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 give, the, to give the law. And God has said he wanted all the children of Israel to come to the, to the base of that mountain there in Mount Sinai. And the Bible tells us there in Exodus in chapter number 19 that there was a, a cloud covering that mountain and that there was lightning and thunder every time that God spoke. And the, all of the children of Israel were there. And it says that the children of Israel, when they were there, when God spoke, that they all trembled because of the awesomeness of God. They trembled because of the awesomeness of God. And here, this picture that we see, you know, with the lightning and the, and the thunder, this imagery here is a reflection of God's power and pending judgment, okay? So this imagery of the thunder, the lightning, and all this stuff is a reflection of God's power and pending judgment that's gonna be poured out, you know, with these seven bowls and, uh, of judgment during the time of the great tribulation. John is getting a glimpse of this throne here. 
And there are the, there are the elders. And now he's, so he sees the throne and now he's going to begin to see what the elders there are doing. And as John explains this, uh, you know, to us here in, in the scriptures, he says there that before the throne, or excuse me, that there's, um, that there's, um, that there's uh, burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And I want to make a mention of this because sometimes, you know, this can be a little confusing. Like seven spirits of God? I thought there was only one spirit of God. What's going on? What does this mean, right? And so the seven spirits of God, guys, represents the perfection and completeness of God the Spirit. Remember, when we were beginning the book of Revelation, I said we're going to be looking at a lot of uh, different numbers uh, here, 24, Right, And the number seven, we, we're going to see uh, very often as we go through um, the book of Revelation as well. And remember, we were talking about the book of Revelation, and the, or excuse me, uh, the number seven and the significance of that number. That number is significant because it, it, uh, it's, it's, it's symbolic of perfection and completeness. And so here, when, when John is saying, and be, um, there he says, burning the seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God, there is is saying here that uh, the Spirit of God represents the perfection and completeness of the Holy Spirit, okay? And then, we again, we get this imagery, uh, again, of this, this still water, right? As we see right there in verse number six, and before the throne, there, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. A sea of glass like crystal. Now, this here, this sea of glass like crystal, Guys, you know, there's a lot of imagery in, in, um, in the book of Revelation and it's pretty amazing when you begin to connect those dots and you look at the tabernacle of God and everything because if you remember the tabernacle of God when, you know, the, in the, when the priest would go into the Holy of Holies, it just wasn't like the mercy seat. The mercy seat was there, but it had to, it had to be, you know, uh, built a certain way, right? With, the, with, the, um, with angels on there. Right. And um, but there wasn't just that on that mercy seat. There was also there was other there was candles and lampstands. Right. And there was also a laver that was there so that when the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies, he would go and he would wash before he would bring that sacrifice there um, on the on the mercy seat. You see, and so here we see again this imagery, you know, the sea of glass, it highlights the magnificence and the magnificence and the holiness and really the fixed holiness of God. This untroubled holiness of God. It's just still right there. And again, as the as it just it's a we see this being pictured in the, ta the building of the tabernacle there when God gave instruction to Moses to have that labor there, right? And that labor was there for, for it to wash and to be cleansed, right? And so that, 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 that uh, so the high priest can be sanctified. Remember the word sanctified means to be set apart or in other words, to be holy, really. Okay, so here we see this holiness, right? And our our washing, when I think of this, guys, what does is, what is our washing consist of? For us, how are we made holy? Or how are we made sanctified? We are sanctified by the washing of God's word. The word of God, we are sanctified because of the power of God's word. And this is one of the reasons why, as I always will always mention here at, at Hope Alive Church, we're going to be, we, we're going to do our very best to be completely faithful to the, the word of God. To rightly divide the scriptures. Because as we know that the scriptures, not only do we, does it feed us and we get built up, but we're also sanctified. We are set apart by the power of God's word. And so here we see this sea of glass. And again, it really does highlight the magnific magnificence and the holiness of God. And then we get into these creatures, the four living creatures that are around the throne. Now again, we're getting to the part, you know, the, the throne and the worship. So here comes the worship part. That around the throne on each side are four creatures, right? And these living creatures, and it says they're full of eyes, front and behind. You know, they, these are creatures that you really literally got eyes behind their head, right? <laughs> now, these created beings, these are created beings here, guys, right? And, and the reason why we know that they're created beings is because they are there found worshiping God. Now, 
Let's not let the description, you know, of these created beings, these creatures, you know, with eyes around their head and everything, you know, distract us, okay? Because that can be easily distracting because some of you are like, oh my gosh, that's kind of creepy, you know? <laughs> What's that really look like? So, but let's not let this kind of a description really truly distract us of what God wants us to really dig out and understand in his scriptures here. So basically, this is telling us that these angels, these created beings, I believe them to be cherubim type of angels, right? They, with all the eyes and everything, they have insight and intelligence. Insight and intelligence. They have the proper perception of God. That's what that is. And what are they doing? They're worshiping God because we see that they're there saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. You see, and so they have, they're worshiping God with the, with the proper perception of God. They're worshiping God, you know, with, with intelligence. They're worshiping God here with insight to the person of God. You see, and I, I love this because this is a, I think this is a great motivation for us to have that same kind of worship of God. You know, just that, just to have the insight of the, the person of God. We worship God because we know who he is. We praise God because we know that he's a God of grace. He's a God of mercy. We, we worship and we lay our lives down and lift up our hands and lift up our voice but because of all the wonderful things that God has done for us in our lives because it's a personal relationship, you see. And as we grow in this personal relationship with God, what is it that we begin to develop? We begin to develop the, the, the real perception of God as a personal Thing. I know who the Lord is in my life. You see, and then we begin to not only just worship him with this insight and intelligence, but we have the proper perception of who God is. And, and, and it's important that we do that, that we worship God in this way. And we see that these living creatures, they're, they're given us, they're, they're, we have a description here that it says that the first living creature is like a lion and the other is like an ox and the third creature is like a man and the fourth, uh, like, the fourth creature like an eagle. Okay, and again, this is the imagery that, and, and John is limited to the language that, that he has, of, you know, our, our human language. But here, you know, uh, some say that these four represent, these, these four creatures represent attributes of God and connect, and, and they are connected to the Gospels. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? So these attributes, a king, right? Uh, or a lion, excuse me, a lion, a, a, an ox, a man, and an eagle. And when you do a study through the, the Gospels, the four Gospels, Matthew is, has always been seen as um, like uh, revealing the attribute of Jesus as king, right? And so we see a lion, right? A lion is always synonymous with the king of the jungle, right? And so here, lion, we see that in, represented in Matthew as king. Um, and the Gospel of Mark the, the highlight there is in the attribute of Jesus there in the gospel of Mark is as a servant. The key verse is found in chapter 10 and verse Mark where it says, you know, Jesus says of himself that the son of man did not come um, to be served, but to serve, okay, to be a servant. And so we see that connection there with an ox because an ox that this animal is used to, as, uh, as to serve. And so ox, um, we see there as a servant. And the gospel of Luke there, Luke, uh, the attribute of Jesus is the son of man, okay? And again, that fourth creature is like a man, right? And so the gospel of Luke, the attribute there is the son of man. And uh, the, uh, the attribute of Jesus there in the gospel of John is the son of God, you know, to come down from heaven as an eagle, right? And so here we see that, that kind of a connection. Now, but what's their sole purpose? Okay, we understand that, okay, great, but what is their sole purpose of these creatures here, these, these cherubim angels, as I believe them to be? Their sole purpose is uninterrupted glory, praise, and worship of the holiness of God. That is their sole purpose. And you see that because it says there at the end of verse number eight, as they, they never cease to pray. They are never getting tired of praying right? Or praising God. And it says, um, they're holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. As I said, this is an extreme emphatic. This, is a, this calls uh, attention to the infinite holiness of God. 
That's what these angels are doing. That's what these created beings are doing. They're calling attention to the, to the holiness of God. We see the same type of illustration in Isaiah in chapter number six when Isaiah sees the throne and he sees God high and lifted up and, and the, the train of his robe is filling the temple with glory and, and he says that he sees the seraphim angels with six wings, you know, uh, and, and they're, 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 they're praising God saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. You see, and that is their sole purpose. And so here we see the throne and we see the sole purpose there, the worship of God there in the throne, right? The worship of God. And now we have finally here in um, this, in verses nine through 11, the purpose. What is the purpose of all of them to be worshiping again? It says that whenever these living creatures they give, would give glory and honor that those that were seated, these 24 elders, that they would get up and they would not just get up, but they would fall down face first, right? And so the purpose, here is the purpose. The purpose of this, this imagery, and we see what was going on there. The purpose is because God is worthy to be praised, He's worthy to be praised. You see that right there in verse number 11. Uh, it says there, worthy are you, our Lord and God. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be praised. And so and that's not, he's not just worthy to be praised, but the purpose also is because all created beings are created to give glory and honor and praise to God. My friends, that means us, you and I, created beings, created for the purpose of giving glory to God, of giving honor to God. And I think when we have this clear vision of what God has done and you have this clarity of who God is on the throne of God and the sovereignty of God, we too would be compelled as these elders or even as Isaiah was, you know, to, to worship God. And we're gonna get into that in just a second. But here it says, you know, this, this purpose, is for them, all the created beings, to give glory to God. The focus of the worship of God is God as creator. Again, look at the end of chapter, uh, there, chapter number four and verse number 11, as says, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your, uh, and by your will they existed and were created. See that there? The focus of worship is God as creator. Now, this vision here, guys, that John is receiving from Jesus, it's actually preparing John for what's going to begin to follow in the next several chapters. We're going to be looking at it in this, the, the judgment, the, the bowls of judgment and the seal. So John is being prepared for all this, but it's not just John, it's also us too as we, as we go through and journey through the scriptures and, and look at as we continue in Revelation. So we're prepared as well. We see what's going on there in the throne of God, you know, during this, or right before this time uh, of the judgment being executed uh, from God during the time of the great tribulation. But I want to say this, something happens when, when people, when we, when anybody, Something happens when a person sees the holiness of God on his throne. Something truly happens when, when somebody just truly understands in the spirit, because only the Holy Spirit can reveal the, the, the majesty and, and the sovereignty of God. And this is one of the reasons why I always say, church, for us, we need a dependence on God, the Holy Spirit, to reveal things to us because in our own, we're not gonna understand. We're not gonna understand, you know, the, 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 the flesh cannot understand the things of the Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit. And so when the Spirit of God reveals the holiness of God and where God is at there on his throne, something happens to a person. Truly, something, something goes down, right? Truly happens. And you know what happens? A life of worship begins to take place. It's, that's what happens. A life transformed, right? Remember, we, we, we desire to go through the scriptures in this way, you know, in, in the Bible, guys, not so that we can get information, but so that we can have transformation because there's power in the word of God. 
because it's the Holy Spirit speaking to us. And that transformation begins to take place in our hearts and in our lives. And so when, when someone sees the glory and the majesty and the holiness of God there, and they, they can, you know, just because the Holy Spirit gives them insight of the picture of the throne room of God, a life of worship begins to take place and praises to God. Where a person is going to, you know, hey, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's, I'm not ashamed to, you know, to show up to church and to lift up my voice. My friends, as church here, you know, for us as people here, man, we, we have a great privilege because we get to practice our worship with, to God now. Because when we get to heaven, we're going to be casting our crowns. We're going to be praising God 24-7. You want to know why? Because he's worthy of our praise. I don't know about you, but man, that just gets me all jacked up on the inside. It's like, man, that's, that's great, Lord. I cannot wait. That's going to be an exciting time. Imagine the sound of that choir. Man, that's going to be awesome. It's going to be awesome. But again, that's exactly what happens. A life transformed, a life of worship begins to take place. And guys, our worship, not just in heaven, but here now on this planet that we call earth, the object of our worship is Jesus Christ. Always our praise in heaven is going to be to Jesus and our praise directed, you know, directed to Jesus now here on earth. It's, he's the object of our worship. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. It's about what he has done for us. Right? And, and as he should be. And our focus and our life, again, when we say worship, I know that we use the word worship in our world, you know, in our church um, community and in this country, really, we say worship and, and we always kind of think of music and, and, and everything. And that's not a bad thing. That's okay because we see that here. But worship really is a life. It's living your life worshipfully before the Lord every single day. It's not, say, it's, not, it's not saying, hey, I'm going to go to worship God, you know, um, what, what, what'd you do yesterday, you know? It's worshiping God with our life being lived out worshipfully. When we sing, you know, it's really praises to God. But that's what happens when one's eyes are truly open. We see that, again, you know, there's a great picture of that when, with, with Isaiah, because when Isaiah saw the throne room of God and, you know, heaven was opened up to Isaiah and he sees these seraphim angels with six wings. The Bible tells us with, with two wings they flew, with two they covered their face, and with two they covered their feet. And they went out, you know, holy, holy, holy is God. And, 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 and what did Isaiah, Isaiah respond? There was a response. As I said, something happens always when one sees and understands the holiness of God and then when the throne is opened up. Isaiah said, he beat his chest. He says, oh, woe is me for I am a man of unclean lips. Basically what Isaiah does is he confesses. Oh my God, I'm confessing of my, woe is me. I need God. And then what we know happens that, that takes place there in Isaiah 6 is that an, one of those angels goes and gets the tongs and gets a coal from the altar. The altar always speaks of a, a place of a sacrifice. And he goes and he gets the coal from the altar and he touches the lips of, of Isaiah and he, and he says to Isaiah, your sin has been cleansed. Your sin is purged. And so we see there was a confession. There was a cleansing and then once, there, once there's that confession and there's a cleansing of sin for anybody, whether it's Isaiah for anybody, you know what begins to happen is that you begin to have a relationship with God. You begin to hear the voice of the Lord speak to us. And, and Isaiah actually heard the voice of the Lord because God said, hey, who will go for us? Whom shall we send? Right? Because there was some, a task that needed to be done. And, and Isaiah was there and he, was, he heard, he heard God. And he, Isaiah responded and said, you know, Lord, I'll go. Send me, I'll go. You see, something happens. Isaiah's sin was, he confessed his sin. He was cleansed of his sin. And then he was commissioned as a follower of God, as a believer in God. He was commissioned to be about God's business. You see, it's the same thing with us. When we see the glory and the holiness of, of what God has done for us, See, friends, listen, God is worthy. Jesus is worthy to be praised. You want to know why? Because he paid the price. He paid the price 
that we should have paid, right? He, he took my sin. He took your sin. And that's his grace. That is his mercy. And a lot of times what keeps us back, what keeps us away from that truth, it really is the condemnation of the devil trying to say, hey, listen, you're not worthy. Oh, your sin is too horrible. Let me tell you something. There's not, there's not any sin that God is not able to forgive. God is able to forgive all sin. Amen. He is able to forgive all sin and he is faithful. Listen, friends, God is faithful to his word because he tells us if you confess your sin, he says, I am faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and to cleanse you of all unrighteousness. He is faithful to his word. This is the reason why he is worthy to be praised because he paid the price. And what is our natural response or at least what should be our natural response is spontaneous worship. God, you died for me. I love you, Lord. I want to worship you, Lord. Like the elders here, these 24 elders, it says that they laid prostrate, really. I don't know if you've ever had that position of praise before God. I have. Not many times, and I didn't even plan it out. You know, I started just praying and had a time of prayer and had some praising, uh, praising God with some music. And you know, I'm sitting down in my, you know, on the couch, just sitting down. Then I stand up. The next thing you know, I sit back down again. And I'm worshiping God, and, but I'm just like, you know, it's really in the spirit, right? And I just found myself on my knees. And the next thing you know, I'm, I'm laid out before the Lord. Sounds kind of a weird thing, right? When you say it, I was like, oh, Tommy, what are you doing? <laughs> you know? I get it. It kind of does. But let me tell you something. When you're worshiping God because you know he's worthy to be praised and you realize the price that was paid for you to be in heaven. Like I didn't even think about it. I just found myself there on, on, on the floor. I wasn't even thinking about how dirty the floor was either. I was just praising God. You see, and that's, that's what happens. We begin to praise God because he's worthy to be praised. And we, as God's children, we, as God's children, should praise in that manner with all of our hearts. Lord, I'm surrendering all to you when we have that clear vision of what God has done. You know, when Jesus was, was there right before he got crucified and, and the religious leaders were like, hey, Jesus, tell all, your, tell all these people to stop praising you, right? During, I was on Palm Sunday, right? Just uh, days before he got crucified and, and Jesus turned to the religious leaders and he said, hey, if, these, if the people stop worshiping, these very rocks will cry out. Remember, all of creation was created to praise God, to worship God. Why? Because he is worthy. All of creation. And God said, hey, if they stay quiet, the rocks are going to cry out. Can you imagine that? It's as if Jesus would say, hey, if you're not going to sing, these chairs are going to sing. <laughs> we have the privilege to exercise this all in response to the holiness and the majesty and the sovereignty of God, of who he is, because he died for us on the cross. And it's a privilege to lift our voice because he's worthy to be praised. Amen. Father, we're so grateful that you have come into this world to die for our sin, to cleanse us of our sin. We're grateful for your word that we can gain insight to the person of Jesus Christ, the object of our worship and praise. And Father, I pray that in the spirit, Lord, through the power and the work and the baptism of your Holy Spirit, Lord, that you would reveal to us your holiness in the same way that you have, Lord, to, to John, in the same way that you have even to, to Ezekiel and, and, and Isaiah and many others. That we would be found as people just worshiping you because you're worthy. 
Father, we love you. We pray that you would do this. Bring glory to yourself. In the name of Jesus, amen.